Well, I would hardly say I had a traumatic or a dramatic beginning. I actually had a pretty good beginning, I think. My parents were both in the home, which I'm very grateful for. I had two older brothers and a younger sister. Uh, my two older brothers were sort of a team and kind of a tough team that I simply grew up feeling excluded from. They had each other. They were far more boisterous and aggressive than I was. So I was usually the bag and they were the punchers. Um, life, not evil, but kind of gave me a sense early on that I wasn't quite up to par with the guys. Now my sister, younger sister, sweet girl, she had her own world. And if there was a deficit at the parental level, it was that my father just wasn't there. He had to work very hard. He was pursuing other things in his life, education-wise and so on. So there wasn't a whole lot of intervention from him. So I basically just felt alone um, with an increasing sense of feeling inferior as a guy in relation to my brothers. I had a friend in elementary school, and we were just good friends. It wasn't high or low, but around fifth or sixth grade, we started experimenting with each other, if you will, which probably for another kind of guy wouldn't have left a mark. But for me, I think it began to set something in motion. I think it took this pretty big emotional need that I had to discover who I was as a guy. I could tell my brothers had done that. <laughs> they had a kind of clarity and power that I didn't. And I think in this relationship with this guy, when it became sensualized, it satisfied something. It, it, it satisfied something and it set something else in motion, which was actually pretty shameful. I guess this guy told another guy uh, what was going on. And so over the course of about two months, all of a sudden, now I'm in seventh grade, everyone thinks I'm gay. All of a sudden I'm in school and people that I knew from various kinds of interests, you know, classes and different clubs and so on and so forth, were accusing me of being a homosexual. Well, I was horrified. I had never thought of myself as that, certainly. Um, and I had no reference point as to what they were speaking of. I wasn't even connecting the label of being homosexual with this sort of sex play that was going on between this kid and I. And I remember at that point in time experiencing a level of shame that I hadn't known before and I probably haven't experienced since. It was as if people were looking at me and seeing me as absolutely inferior and perverted. And so that changed the course of my early life because from that point on, I saw myself differently. I saw myself as not having freedom to be normal in relationship to those really crucial years. The way I see it now, I didn't see it then, but the way I kind of see it today, it's as if that sort of male sexual stuff, which is just about becoming a powerful and strong person for others, first in relationship to other guys, and then for women, you know, the, the, the power of that going out to women, at that point, it, kind of all went sideways. <laughs> and with it going sideways, there was just this terrific fear of being found out and known. The relationship that I had with this other kid was a tender strength, an experience of tender strength. My experience with my brothers was strength with no tenderness. And my father was so distant there was no real connection there. So there was the power of his masculinity, in a sense, combined with a sort of tenderness. I think that was it. Um, the sensual component, I, I guess at that age, you know, everything is kind of powerful in that way. 
But I think the core need was an experience, a bond with a, a sort of tender strength. We went off to different junior high schools. I lost track of him altogether. And so that was not to be an enduring link, but it did leave now a label and a fear of being known as if people could see something that was really wrong in me, that I had no aspiration of deeming homosexual. <laughs> that was hardly what I was looking for in junior high. I ran into some kids who, like me, had same-sex issues in high school. And so that became my identity. That was a place where I could land. That was the only thing I felt like I had in common with these other guys. And we started going off into Hollywood and so on and so forth. I was in Southern California, so we had to leave our little suburban roost and kind of go into the, the city, if you will. Um, but all the while, while I was kind of going into this and, you know, cyclical relationships and so on, I mean, we were so young, really. I had this brother who was a Christian, fiery. My, my brother just, just above me became one like him. And so there was this witness of Jesus just in their lives, even though I really didn't like him. And we, you wouldn't say we related in a trusting or close way. But their life spoke louder in some ways than their, you know, kind of specific preaching to me. So all this stuff is going on, and now I'm in university, and I'm thinking, you know, I'm just kind of a gay dude, and that's how it is. And the university where I was had a big gay student union. There were kind of two groups. There was the gay student union, and there were the Christians. And I was kind of lining up with the gay student union, though it was as if because of the intercession of my brothers, the Christians were all sort of breathing down my neck, you know? Like, I almost had the sense that I know I'm going to go there. I know I'm going to end up there. I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that another guy actually can't complete the need. You know, I, I think I knew that pretty early on. So I was somewhat of a realist, but I honestly didn't, well, I certainly had not experienced any other option, and so I guess... Being in darkness, I felt like there probably wasn't any except this Jesus thing. <laughs> so I met a couple of people my age that were Christians, and they kind of began witnessing to me in a way that I could understand. And so I started thinking about it a little bit more. And I was living with a bunch of gay dudes at this point, and I began to explore Jesus a little bit. And a couple of things that became really apparent to me was that Jesus meant that God kind of gave everything to us. Like, he couldn't give anything more, you know, than Christ on the cross. If, if this Jesus was God, then he gave everything. He gave his life. He, he couldn't give more. So I thought, wow, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a lot to give, you know? And that, that kind of drew me in a little bit. I think what scared me was that I also believed that God asked everything from us, that similarly, to follow him, we had to give our lives. And I didn't know if I would do that, could do that, wanted to do that, but I kind of knew that was what was going on with Christianity, <laughs> pretty simple. There was a group that was meeting on campus called the Bible and Homosexuality, and I thought, well, maybe this is a key or the world's coming together. It was awful. They were all terribly liberal, and it was all basically just a gay rights advocacy group. I mean, it had very little to do with Jesus. And so the longer I sat there, I thought, hey, this has nothing to do with Jesus. And even if they're sort of attaching Jesus to this in some way, they don't know anything about this God who gave everything and then asks everything of us. So I calmly brought up that point. I just said, people, I thought I was coming to something about God and Jesus and how he helps us. All you're telling me is basically he doesn't have to help us because it's okay that we're gay. I thought, that just doesn't register. That just was not reality for me. I thought, this is not reality. So... 
I think that was actually a step in the conversion process. And then I just kind of quietly took the step. I just thought, I'm, I believe him. I'm just going to follow him. So, so that was my conversion. It was very quiet. It wasn't very dramatic. There was no change in my sexuality having made that decision. I think it was just a change in my allegiance. At that point, I thought, I'm going to follow Jesus. I moved into a house that was full of these Christian guys, very conservative, that were actually pretty good guys. And I mean, they were smart guys. They really were not bigoted guys. I was very honest about where I had come. I was honest about wanting to live within the lines, but realizing that was easier said than done, easier to know the truth and to live it. But I was committed to living it best I could. So I had some support there. Um, I began to realize, uh, even then, the Broken Image, which was a watershed book for me, Leanne Payne's book, had not yet come out. But I began to attend this little church. A couple of the guys in this house were. It was the vineyard. It was the first vineyard church um, in West L.A., very near the campus. And I began to go to this church. And this church was unique. It was all about the mercy of God. It was also all about the truth of God and the truth of what he wants for us. So though it led out with mercy, it was actually very strong in its sexual ethic and also strong in the consequence of remaining in sexual sin. As you know, maybe, maybe not, the vineyard introduced a level of intimacy, in worship that I don't think was present in the church before. It was invitational, very intimate worship, which was very compelling for me. And we had this worship leader who was kind of a Hollywood musician guy, this kind of slow-eyed, you know, sort of sexy guy. <laughs> um, and he was sleeping with his girlfriend. Now, no one knew this. No one was high-fiving it, but she became pregnant. And the pastor said, well, you've led us in worship, and we've all come under the great gift of your leadership in worship, but you've also introduced some sexual immorality into our midst. And so why don't we all come alongside of you and really help you? Um, he had to step down. He had to tell the church, but we were really loving, embracing of him and, and this woman they got engaged to be married, and the church was really supportive of coming around them. We were all at the wedding, all celebrated the birth of this kid, but it really ch showed me something about how mercy and discipline are not mutually exclusive, that they really go together. And that was really blessed for me. I thought, you know, I'm not the biggest sinner here. You know, I'm, I am really seeking God's grace to be free. <laughs> of my homosexual compulsion. And, and the pastor is, is insisting on a level of purity and holiness for all of us. So that was really key for me. It was also a church that was more sophisticated in regards to pastoral care. This is where Leanne Payne comes in because the broken image had just come out. I was in my last year at school now. And, um, there was so much insight in that book that combined the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit to heal the deep places while naming and shedding light on the complexities of our hearts. Like I discovered, and it just gave words for, I think what I knew, but I could certainly not have articulated that my homosexuality had to do with this deep ache for that tender strength from a man that, I had not discovered adequately with my brothers and that my father was not available to give and that had become sexualized in this early relationship. And so to discover that the way forward for me in Christ was to actually work out with integrity my relationships with men was so important. I just so happened to be in a roommate situation in this Christian house with this very beautiful man. I don't know how else to put it. He was beautiful in spirit. He was very handsome. And 
I was fairly well along now in my walk. I was certainly sexually sober. I was not using porn. I was getting pretty free. But there was still a lot of same-sex attraction. And I felt like the Lord in this instance, through this good pastoral care at the church and some of Payne's insights and so on, was saying, you need to press into this relationship. Like, you have to walk through this relationship to come out to the other side. This is not the kind of relationship you flee because you're afraid. And I think before, when I would get in relationships where those needs were coming up and there was an attraction, I would flee. I mean, I would do the First Corinthians 6 thing. It was like, man, I, I ain't sticking around. I couldn't flee this. I mean, this was my roommate. He was a solid guy. And I just had to work it out. And I felt like what was happening is I worked out, you know, feeling things that I hadn't felt in a long time and wondering, have I taken nine steps back and so on and so forth. It was as if God was accessing all of the stuff that I had been sort of just trying to keep at bay. It was coming up in pretty intensive homosexual desires. And as I walked through it in this relationship and just stayed present, nothing happened or, you know, whatever, just walking it out, practicing the presence of God, finding good, you know, steadying friendships, but staying in this one as well. I actually came through, there was something about this, I almost see it like almost like a molten lava that I had to kind of experience in order to get through it until it solidified. And in this relationship, I really came through something significant that I could face my desires and my fears and actually continue to be a man amongst men. It's really important. When that, those desires would come for this guy, and they weren't constant, but they would come up, and especially because, you know, he would sort of trigger me. I mean, I'm in the same room with him, and... It's like, whoa, there's a little too much here. I would just offer it to the Lord. I wouldn't shame myself, I wouldn't beat myself. I'd offer it, I'd say, Lord, you know this doesn't please me. You know I don't want to sexualize this. You know I just want to honor this guy as a guy. I'm a guy, he's a guy. I want to get there. <laughs> I would just offer it to the Lord. I had to exercise a lot of self-control, not to fall into masturbation or fantasy. I discovered that I really had a choice as to what I thought about. I didn't have to take those desires and make them something else. Um, and as I stayed present to him in the relationship, growing in Christ, you know, doing our lives together as students and you know, different missionary stuff and all that we did on the campus, there was a kind of solidarity with him that transformed that longing to kind of be with him into being alongside of him. And uh, I was in this roommate situation for about a year. And so the combination of releasing, exercising necessary self-control at the level of fantasy, continuing in friendship, not exclusive friendship with others, it was a house full of guys, um, I got through it and I, to this day, we're friends. There's no eroticization, no sexualizing. And it's not to say the result of that was no more same-sex attraction, but I faced the enemy and I realized that I, I actually was stronger in Christ than the threat and the fear and the shame of a particular kind of attraction. And... Uh, so that was really big for me. As a result of working things out in this relationship and some good experiences of caregiving and so on at this vineyard, I began to desire relationship with woman. I wanted relationship with woman. I realized that I didn't want to be just working out my life with other guys. I didn't think I was called to celibacy, although I, I didn't know that much about it at that point, honestly. I just prob I just assumed I wasn't. Um, so I, you know, I kind of began engaging with women in a different way, man, woman, a little bit. And I met this woman that ultimately became my wife. And our 
friendship, our communion was forged around our commitment to Jesus and this particular community. So we had this you know, group of young adults that we were working out things with. So we had a world that was bigger than just she and I, which was probably helpful for me and the scary aspects of it. Um, but we, we began to grow together as man and woman. I really began to enjoy spending time with her. She was in no hurry to marry. There was no pressure. We were just working out our lives together in Jesus. And there was a real sweetness to that. We were both finishing up at school. And my pastor, uh, who, you know, was on the ball and could see the needs that were going on and in this church, this church went from 300 to 2,000 in a year. It was truly a church in revival in West LA. It was a lot of sort of creative types of people, the majority of whom had sexual problems. Now, clearly, my desire was to help people that were dealing with same-sex attraction. That was what I understood. I could tell on the campus, again, gay student union, Christian groups. It was, it was, these were both powerful forces in our young adulthood, at least at the UCLA campus. And I thought, wow, if we're going to reach these people, we've got to start dealing with these things head on. And so my pastor felt the same. And he encouraged me. He could see that Annette and I were growing together. We weren't in any way engaged or married, but we were good. I mean, and our life was about Jesus. I mean, our life really wasn't about being a UCLA student or our great vocational goals or how much money we had. We had no money. Our goals were subject to Jesus Christ. <laughs> and it was just sort of Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. So our pastor had a lot to work with, you know, because we were, we were pretty available. And uh, he said, why don't you help people? You know, there's a lot of people here dealing with sexual things and homosexual things in particular. And so I talked to Annette about it and I said, you know, could we do something? And she said, yeah, you know, we'll, we could see. So I shared my story in front of the church. Again, this is a big church. And I just shared it like I saw it, you know, and a lot of people came forward and wanted help. And there was a man had HIV actually, they didn't know what HIV was then. It, it still was the killer disease without a name in the West Hollywood community. This was kind of the end of the disco era. So it was wildly homosexual, very, very popular in that community, wildly promiscuous, drug addled. And so AIDS was being, was being spread like wildfire and no name for it. So there was this man that was getting sick. He had been one of the big designers in West Hollywood. His brother or something was a vineyard Christian and he became a Christian. He had this great house in West Hollywood. And, and so my pastor said, hey, why don't you talk to him and see if he'll host this group? So um, Annette and I um, started driving from, you know, down Venice Boulevard all the way up into Midtown and then over into West Hollywood. <laughs> every week. <laughs> it's our last year of school here. And at this designer's home, and God began to minister to people. And um, the Holy Spirit was moving so quickly in that time. I don't know how else to put it. I think what I see now is that people had a death sentence, you know? We all know that we all have one, you know, we're all under the sentence of death in the sense of the limit of our mortality here on earth. But in those days, it was HIV. It, people had a time bomb going on in their bodies that was leaving them without any defense, literally no defense. You know, in their moral nakedness, they had nothing to stave off um, the, the evil of infection. It was wild. 